Maybe boys are cute, I don't know. I don't know, gosh. <laughs> this podcast is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Spoiler warning for whatever is in the title of this episode. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share and subscribe. Follow Daniel at dstarsick on Twitter. Follow Ryan at Darth Damio on the Bluebird app. You can find the podcast on Twitter at Horopod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Welcome to episode 53 of The Horror of Babylon, where we are discussing the 1910 and 1931 adaptations of Frankenstein. I am Ryan, and with me as always is Daniel. Say hi, Daniel. It's a lie! I expect Uh, that sound clip to be somewhere in here. Yep, I was already planning on it. (laughs) I'm going to put it right here. It's a lie. And right here. It's a lie. And right here. And also later in the thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And of course, this show is brought to you by our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan, the, the Full, Full Metal, Metal patron. patron. He seemed to like his title. So Good. That's you know, cool. it, it's funny. <laughs> I don't know what her opinion is now, but like back when we were hanging out a lot, mm-hmm. Full Metal Alchemist was, was Abigail, Abby's favorite anime. I remember that. So it, it's funny that we gave... The next person. <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I didn't think we were going to get a second one. <laughs> yeah. that, that quick. Yeah. And so I was just like, oh, a, Abby's a strong female character. I'll just yep. start doing Game of Thrones references. <laughs> I, I remember back in the day she liked Game of Thrones. Of course, that's a whole nother thing now. Yeah. Like, like a lot of people don't anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, we are going to review two films today, the 1910 and the 1931 film adaptations of Frankenstein. We're going to do one and then the other. Daniel, can you kick us off with your history of these films? I had never seen either until this uh, we did this podcast. I watched them both for the first time. Uh, when I was a teenager, like young teenager, like 12, 13, I watched a lot of the Universal Monster movies. I probably, like, was tacitly aware of them before that because I collected a lot of monster toys. They started playing, like, those old black and white ones a lot, like, every Halloween. So I'd always watch them. You know, I got used to watching Dracula, Frankenstein, all those. Uh, When I got older, when I was in college, I watched this dude called the Angry Video Game Nerd. And every year he did a uh, Cinemasker Halloween thing where he talked about the history of films. And that got me into learning the history of films. So I got to learn about the history of the uh, 1931 Frankenstein movie. It's actually from him that I learned about the 1910 one. Because he's like, did you know this is actually not the first on-screen adaptation of Frankenstein? It's And then he starts going on about this. So I was like, oh. Ah. And then I looked it up and I watched it. The vampires are pure myth, superstition. I may be able to bring you proof that the superstition of yesterday can become the scientific reality of today a little background on the 1910 frankenstein which is what we will be doing first yep it was of course premiered in 1910 and it was by edison studios as in thomas edison studios and it's generally recognized by film historians to be the first screen adaptation of frankenstein and of course it is based on the novel by mary shelley i believe in both of these movies, she's she's named like Mrs. Percy Shelley or something like like she's referred to as her husband's wife, which is that's, horrible. That's so quaint. <laughs> Calling it quaint is the <laughs> nicest way you can describe that. 
(laughs) Thankfully, she gets just a wee bit more recognition today. The screenplay was written by, and it was directed by, J. Cyril Dolly, who did a lot of other adaptations at the time. He made a a short film on the Boston Tea Party. He adapted Bluebeard, Prince and the Pauper, Hansel and Gretel, and some Jules Verne stuff for film. Uh, I believe a lot of those were also for Edison Studios. This movie was shot over three days in New York City. Can you imagine shooting a movie over three days? Even a 10-minute movie. Yeah. It's insane to think of that. At least a 10-minute movie where you put some effort into it. I found this while doing some research. I'm just going to read you a quote because I personally felt like this was some kind of bullshit. But in making the film, the Edison Company had carefully tried to eliminate all actual repulsive situations and to concentrate its endeavors upon the mystic and psychological problems that are found to be in the weird tale. Uh I call bullshit on that. (laughs) So let's just go ahead to general discussion on the film. The thing that sticks out to me is the creation scene. It it might be my favorite creation scene just because it's so different from any other. It's so different. (laughs) It grossed me the fuck out and scared the hell out of me. I would say it's the most alchemic of any of the Frank creations. And And I've seen a few adaptations. Almost all of them are like dead bodies come together lightning mm-hmm. that's that's like the go-to you're doing frankenstein this one was like he puts his ingredients in a pot puts the pot in a giant machine it was almost like a like a pottery oven yeah yeah it, it was like a kiln a I, kiln that's yeah I, I believe i even read that he they were inspired by like myths of the creation of a golem mm-hmm. and uh so the jewish monster I really, that's something I would like to see more of. Yeah, we should find a Golem book. Uh, there's a go, there's a Golem movie. There's a series of Golem movies, uh, silent films, hmm. that, that I also learned about from Cinemassacre's cool. Monster Man. And this was probably my favorite actual creation of the monster. At least now it's the most imaginative. I'm sure 1931's was super imaginative at the time, but now that's... It's hard to judge that one because it's so iconic and so... Like, we're just so used to it. Yeah, and that's what everyone's defaulted to. But, I mean, yes, obviously, if you if you looked at 1931's creation scene in a vacuum, like, never have, having known anything about Frankenstein, it'd probably be up there, too. Yeah. But, yeah, I think that's, like, the main standout thing of this to me. Another big thing that I took away from this film was the design of the creature. Yeah. Just so absurdly different from anything we've ever really seen. Kind, kind of look the Hunchback of Notre Dame-ish. Yeah, kind of like if uh, Quasimodo yeah, like was like uh, chained in that tower and never allowed to... Well, I know he wasn't allowed to leave, but like literally chained to the wall and for was there for like years and years. I, th- I know what I really want from a, a future adaptation. I don't know if we're going to get it in any of the other movies we're watching, because in the book, the monster's eight feet tall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, tall monsters are a big thing now. Like, you got the giant vampire mommy from Resident Evil. Mm-hmm. I almost feel like you could do a stalker video game of just Frankenstein hunting you. Ooh, for a tall monster. That would be that'd be too much for me. <laughs> like, you, like you run around playing as Victor, trying to get things to like fuck with it. Two two things that really scare me are, are giants and like home invasion type things. Or like, oh like, man, you didn't get to the uh, Mister X portion of the Resident Evil Two remake, did you? No. It's a, literally an eight foot tall dude chasing you around the PlayStation for the rest of the game. No. <laughs> yeah. And you can't kill him. Mm -hmm. You just have to get to segments where he's kind of blocked off. Another scary thing I thought was... uh, Now, I might be getting my adaptations mixed up here because I've watched way too many Mm -hmm. in the past week. But this one did have a scene where the... Where Victor goes to bed and the monster wakes him up, right? Yeah, that it, it, that scared the crap out of me. Like it's hovering over him. It's like right out of the book. Mm-hmm. It's a scene that I don't think a lot of other things have done. I'm struggling to think of any of the other adaptations. Because it, it kind of follows him in. And he's all Mister Curious Monster. I thought that was terrifying. Yeah. I, I, again, I, the creation seemed super uh, creative because it was like they melted a dummy and then reversed it hmm. as the creation. I was not expecting practical effects that advanced from a 1910. Yeah. yeah. I've seen student films that have less effort put into it. I've seen like professionally made short films that have 
less effort put into it. And I was I was honestly kind of impressed. Yeah, same. So I think the, the it has a few of those strong scenes though. Uh, for me, the weakest part is how it just kind of ends. Yeah, the monster looks in the mirror and disappears. <laughs> yeah, which granted, I know they only had like ten to twelve minutes. But and it's like, hard. What all can you adapt? In yeah, minutes? exactly. So I don't want to be too harsh on it for that, but yeah. it kind of feels like a wet fart when you have just like all this awesome stuff, and then it's just like yeah, the monster looks in the mirror and goes, "Oh, I am ugly," but then Victor sees the monster in the mirror and he's like, "We got to say." <laughs> I probably would have just like done something like totally outrageous, like the monster kills Victor and Elizabeth, and then. Eats walks them. off. Yeah, he eats them, exactly. <laughs> you, you love it when giants eat people. No, no, favorite. I do not. <laughs> we talked about, like, how in the book things are super melodramatic, and I think that oh, yeah. that, that works well for silent films. So where you have to be, melodramatic. Where you have to be super expressive, because yeah. there's no sound. If you like Nosferatu, yeah. I would definitely give this a shot. You can watch it for free on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Just Google Frankenstein 1910. Actually, I will put together a Frankenstein playlist Mm -hmm. for our YouTube page that has, like, a bunch of analysis and lore videos, and it'll have this on it, too. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I'm just like, I don't know, man. I I, I was a lot more impressed with it than I thought I would be. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really neat part of uh, film history. It's good for the... good for the brand. Yeah, you are not... (laughs) you're not gonna waste ten minutes of your life by watching this. Oh my god, are you Stephen King? No, I'm Dean Koontz. Oh. So what is your king? Uh, my king is the monster creation. My king is also the monster creation. Is our Koontz the same? My Koontz is the ending. Yeah, my Koontz is also the ending. <laughs> okay, there we go. Well, I, I think it's hard to argue against either one of those. No, okay. really, really not. It's rank, and I already added it to my list. And, oh yeah, let me let me see. Uh, so I put it like almost like directly in the middle. It's my number sixteen. Not bad. Below uh, Firestarter Two because Firestarter Two is just so outrageous and funny, and above the Mermaid Forest anime series. Firestarter Two is pretty fun. There, there are some. We should do a like a stream where we do a drinking game to Firestarter Two. When do we drink? <laughs> I we'll have to. We'll come up with the rules. Okay. <laughs> All right, your list is in front of you. A- anytime something's uncomfortably sexual. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, let's see here. It's below that. Below that. Scroll down a little bit. Man, I I, th- I think I might actually like it even more than Beast, honestly. I'm putting it above Beast. And below Roar, the most dangerous movie ever made. It's kind of high on my list. So I had it at 16, you have it at 13. That's not bad. Yeah. It's pretty close. Yep. Yeah. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. In the name of God. Now I know what it feels like to be God. So let's go ahead and move on to Frankenstein 1931. I'm going to give some general background, and I know you have a lot more knowledge to throw in whenever. It was, of course, released in 1931 by Universal Pictures, same year as Bela Lugosi's Dracula. Yeah. Directed by James Whale, who also directed The Invisible Man and The Bride of Frankenstein. I don't want to mention this because I don't want you know him to be like identified by his sexuality he it's significant because he was openly gay his entire career in 1931 damn yeah in in the 20s and 30s like you didn't that wasn't something that people did well you could go to jail yeah places yeah just there there were active sodomy laws yep i so just like that's me giving him props and saying like kind of like wow uh he paved the way for fence sitters like me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> maybe boys are cute i don't know i don't know gosh <laughs> the screenplay actually has seven different writing credits so if you you want to look at the various different people who contributed to the script just hop on over to imdb and look at all the different names there, there's quite a few uh, real quick this came out the uh, same year as bella lugosi's dracula right he was offered to play the monster and he turned it down because he thought he wouldn't be able to act. Because he, like, he read the script, he's like, I'm just grunting the whole time. Why would I want to do this? That's fair, and I understand. But, you know, I'm, we're coming from 
a much later point in film history where we we've right. seen performances like David Prowse and the Darth Vader armor, mm-hmm. and, and we know like how important like posture and you know like just body presence and intimidation like it's more than just speaking acting is it's funny because Bella Lugosi when he, later he wouldn't be able to find very many other acting roles and he was living in poverty would play the Frankenstein monster yeah that's funny <laughs> I felt kind of Bella, like when we do Dracula Bella Lugosi's story super sad oh. it's depressing he, oh. he, he dies impoverished I love Bella Lugosi he was such uh, a good Dracula uh, uh, Boris Karloff skyrocketed his entire career yeah yeah as it should have budget about a quarter of a million dollars uh two hundred and sixty two thousand dollars and seven i wonder what box office all... 12 million okay so a quarter of a million so that's four so that's 40 like it's like 48 it made like 40 times 48 times its budget yeah that's crazy like I said, I had never seen this before. Of course, I, you know, I'm familiar with, like, the tropes and everything just from seeing it parodied a hundred times and, yeah. and, and all that. Um, but I, I've never actually sat and watched the movie. I did the other night. And I actively, I went in there and I said, okay, I know this is not going to be a good adaptation of the novel. Yeah. I'm going to set that aside and just try to look at this in a vacuum, like... Like, I've never read the book, and I'm just, like, going to a theater and seeing this for the first time. You're a high school kid, and you don't want to read the book. Yeah. <laughs> then you write a report, <laughs> and you fail. Fuck <laughs> you, the movie's good. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I loved it. I thought, yeah. it, I thought it was great. I also thought it was great. Uh, as a fan of the book, there are certain things that annoy me to no end. Uh, primarily switching victor and oh henry's first names why spoilers yeah, that's my coon why like it serves zero purpose and it's not even like they like renamed the characters and just gave them like different names they if they remade star wars and they're like okay the, the big hairy guy will be han and the smuggler will be chewbacca i, I have a theory and i don't have any way to confirm this that there was like a studio exec or maybe it was even the director who went Victor's not a very heroic name. <laughs> but he, he needs a strong English name like Henry. I mean, that's that's what I thought. Like, when I heard his name was Henry, I thought, oh, they just wanted him to have a more English name. But then I heard his best friend's name is Victor. And I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm so pissed. <laughs> Which is weird because the, the movie kind of plays... Uh, uh, Frankenstein to be a little bit sinister, so I, I figure Victor would be perfect. Yeah, it's funny how Bride flips that. Yeah, I'm tr- gonna try not to get into Bride. He, 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 they got the unhinged part down. My, one of my favorite parts is when he brings Victor and Elizabeth and the Doctor, whose name I can't remember, up to the tower and says, "Fine, you want to see what I'm doing? You want to see my experiment? Come on up, and I'll show you." And he just has this huge monologue, and I love it. I'll show you. Exactly. Oh my God, I loved it. Victor, you're insane. Or Henry, you're insane. (laughs) Henry, you're insane. Bet. (laughs) (laughs) Hold my beer. I'll show you insane. Even acknowledges later that he was insane. So just so let's just talk about Victor. Obviously, no, you mean Henry? Oh. <laughs> it's so hard. It's the hardest thing in the world. Let's talk about. You can't even say. Let's talk about Frankenstein. Yeah. Uh, so obviously not a great adaptation of the character from the novel, but there are elements there. Like uh, he was a university student who surpassed his teachers and decided to leave and pursue his own studies. Like if you could figure out like literally how to create life from nothing. Yeah, like <laughs> why would you stay in school? <laughs> why am I going to study your nonsense? Yeah. I'm so far advanced. He also ignored his family and his betrothed, yeah. just like he he does in the book. They're not cousins. Yeah, which I I guess I understand. We get uh we we get his like uh convenient uh head fever yeah <laughs> oh i'm so stressed you you do get to see him like pillaging bodies mm-hmm. so there are there are some definite similarities which is it was super morbid for the time yeah and very oh I, I i do have another little piece of movie trivia uh when he's like screaming it's alive it's alive and- which i'll put in here it's alive it's alive and here it's alive 
He goes, now I know what it feels like to be God. When it was originally released, they covered that up with thunder because they thought it would be offensive. And it probably would have been. Yeah. But, I mean, that's the point. Of, that's the character. That's yeah, what the story I, is. That kind of core theme of a man playing God kind of carries o- over pretty well from the book, but is obviously just not as deeply explored. Uh, mostly because the movie kind of implies if he got a different brain, it would have been okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where, as the mo- where the book is, it was never going to be okay because of how Victor treated his creation upon seeing it. He didn't take responsibility. Right. Where this was, he was trying to take responsibility, but the brain was wrong. They do try to make him... He, he seems a little more villainy in the beginning. Yeah. But as it progresses, it makes him... As you read the book, Vic, to me, Victor becomes less sympathetic. Yeah, he, he starts off okay and he gets less. And this is the reverse. Yeah. Uh, really, the biggest difference is obviously the creature. Mm-hmm. And the, there's no, no real debate there. Yeah, it, it, the book is an eloquent, very intelligent. Mm-hmm. Absor- I read Milton. He, he learns language by, wa- by like reading people's lips through a wall. Yeah, and... And the movie's like, Aah! yeah, I still love that performance. No, it's iconic. B- Boris Karloff was awesome. I legitimately thought he was scary when they're out with torches searching for him, and Victor's up looking on the cliff. Henry is up looking on the cliffs. Uh, the scene where the monster comes out from behind the rock, and he's just like two heads taller. Mm-hmm. That oh my gosh, that that, that almost could have been a scene out of the book. Where, yeah, like he first sees his creation again. Yeah, yeah, it could have. Um, I love this part with the little girl because she's. Like, I love and hate it. Look, I can make the flowers float, and the monster doesn't get it because he's a big old dumbass. He's like, oh, this is fun. I'll make you float. <laughs> <laughs> his first murder is not malicious yeah but then every murder after that is super malicious yeah he's just like oh might as well <laughs> my criminal brain has been activated it cannot be helped if if human beings won't respect me why should i respect them <laughs> this is pretty great yeah oh we should definitely talk about fritz yeah uh and of course, like if you asked a random person off the street, said, "Okay, Frankenstein, name just like f- what are the first like five things that come to mind when you think Frankenstein?" Probably Igor would be something. And of course, that name comes from the movie *Son of Frankenstein*. Even this is the origin of the character, but his name is Fritz. Fun fact: Bella Lugosi also played Igor. <laughs> When he was first named. Uh, Igor himself <laughs> has become an I- an iconic movie character like yeah. to the point... He's, he's usually drawn as a hunchback now, too. He even had his own animated movie where John Cusack played Igor. <laughs> and we're going to get a Daniel Radcliffe version soon. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what that's going to be like. I saw, I haven't watched it yet. I, that's the one I haven't watched yet, so... Yeah, and don't, don't tell me anything I'm about Mary no, Shelley. My, my lips are sealed. Um... I so I watched I watched 1910 and 1931, and then I was like fuck it, and I watched Bride of Frankenstein. So good, it, yeah, it was it blew me away. And then I watched Young Frankenstein, and now I'm like, wow, I I had to like stop. Bride of Frankenstein might I had it and like rewatch literally all of them, and there's more than you think because it's the original cinematic universe. Yeah, uh, but it might be the best Universal monster movie. I. I think maybe I like it more than Frankenstein 1931, but they're so different. Yeah. Because, like, Bride is really, like, more of a comedy, and this is more of a horror, so it's it's hard to, like, say, like... I'm what? also a really big fan of The Wolfman, though, so... I haven't seen that either. I guess the only one I've really seen is, is Dracula. Whenever we get around to doing horror blind spots, we'll add that to the list. Yeah. This is this is the origin uh, of Igor, that Frankenstein trope. Fritz. Fritz. One of my favorite scenes was where Fritz is murdered. It's just they're just hanging out in the lab, and then they hear, <laughs> <laughs> and then they run down there, and the monsters just got him goosed up on the ceiling, and hung him up like a like dry cleaning. It's so funny. 
<laughs> he died like a bitch. <laughs> he did. Because, and I was, he, the scene before that is Fritz literally torturing him with a torch. Like, ah, just being a dick. He's just like, ah, look at this fire. Ah, I'm like, uh, you shouldn't do that, man. And then the monster really just gooses him and puts him up on the wall like a painting. It's so funny. Frankenstein's sitting there going, I'm going to scream. <laughs> Like a bitch. <laughs> and then he's like, what's that sound? And then he screams again, oh my god, it's Fritz! <laughs> uh, that was hilarious. Also, uh, like, mobs uh, carrying pitchforks and f uh, torches. That that all originates here. Yeah, like, the closest you get to that in the book is when he's talking about villagers chasing him out. Yeah. But that's kind of super nondescript. Yeah, it, it doesn't really give you specifics like the movie does. I, I could see that, like, inspiring the specifics of torches. Yeah. Uh, another thing, uh, fr another takeaway for me from this movie is the ending is so dark, <laughs> so dour. They literally just torch him and burn him to death yeah not really because he escaped into an underground uh you know well but whatever uh but yeah it's just like oh he's trying to escape and a beam falls in and he gets trapped under the beam and he burns to death and then you're like oh did uh did victor survive i don't know like <laughs> do you nobody really knows <laughs> well james wales knows because he made the sequel bride of frankenstein where you find out that victor did live but uh, oh, another thing. Victor's dad is hilarious. Uh, Vic Damn it, Henry! <laughs> I was doing a count in my head. <laughs> he did, no, fuck it. He's Victor Frankenstein. He's not Henry. Yeah, it's such a stupid change. Baron Frankenstein is hilarious. Yeah, he's a great actor. <laughs> I wish, like... I could see him in more. I guess I could look him up and find him in more stuff. But I would. I would have liked a movie just about uh, Baron von Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> My son is such a little prince. <laughs> You're going to college. These films are considerably shorter than a lot of other things we've covered. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, there are deep dives to take. We we mainly talk about if it's a good adaptation. If we enjoyed it, and yeah, like stuff you can get out of it. Um, I'll tell you that there's a lot of good deep dives. You can find them easily on YouTube. Personally, I'm not knowledgeable enough to to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really like the movie. Would highly recommend it. Also, really recommend Bride of Frankenstein. Of course, Young Frankenstein. Like it's just. It's I also a, like Frankenstein versus the Wolfman. Uh, so I want to watch that one, and I want to watch uh, Son of Frankenstein. It's good. Uh, anything with Abbott and Costello, I also recommend. Abbott, I've I have seen Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. That's a good one as well. I think those are funny. Yeah, I, I love Abbott and Costello meet the Mummy. That's a great one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. My King is where uh, the monster gooses Fritz and throws him up on the wall like a fresh coat of paint. Uh, my King is when he throws the little girl on the river. <laughs> God. Because <laughs> I laughed for like ten minutes. I am my Koontz's changing Henry and Victor's names for no reason. <laughs> That's also my kid. It's so stupid. <laughs> it's so bad. Uh, and then rankings. Here's your list. Oh boy, I think I'm gonna put it above X. So below Firestarter 1984? Yeah. I think uh, like Firestarter and Hellraiser like hit certain things that are like way more personally appealing to me. But this is... This is a classic. This is making it my top. And that makes it your number seven. That's pretty good. I have it at number five. Not bad. Uh, below it, 2017, which explained that a hundred times. Like there are very low lows in that movie, but the best parts of that movie are just amazing. Yeah. And then I have it above the mist, which I'm not even sure that it is a better movie than The Mist, but I definitely enjoy watching this movie more than I enjoy watching The Mist. Yeah. And then, like, the top three are kind of hard to, hard to beat for you. I mean, yeah, It, Dog Soldiers, and Call Girl of Cthulhu are, are probably going to be my top three for a long time. I fucking love Call Girl of Cthulhu. Yeah. I'm going to watch that again. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Homework. Uh, what do you think Mary Shelley would have thought of both of these films? Uh, I think she would have looked at moving pictures and been like, what has science wrought? <laughs> what sorcery is this? And I would have thought that, like, well, she would think, well, if people had these to watch when volcanoes 
rip summer away from us then why would they come up with the new stories <laughs> and then our question for the listeners is what other frankenstein adaptations do you recommend uh, we do already have a schedule set but if there's something that's you know really advocated we might consider uh, doing a bonus episode so reach out to us on our socials and let us know you're about to hear those and then for further reading uh I, you know i think i can definitely recommend the other universal horror films which which ones in particular do you recommend? Uh, the Wolfman, Dracula, Frankenstein versus the Wolfman, Bride of Frankenstein, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, God, I even like uh, a Son of Dracula. Like that's the first time I think like the the name Alucard comes up in like popular culture. God, I'd have to sit and make a list. That's what I think yeah. you. Uh, I think you covered it. Yeah. All right. So upcoming on the horror of Babylon. That's this will be our last episode of 2022. Our next episode will drop New Year's Day 2023, Ooh. and we will be starting the year off with some Junji Ito. We're going to cover Frankenstein by Junji Ito, and then the next Sunday, January 8th, will be our final Frankenstein episode. We are talking about doing some bonus episodes, but our last regularly scheduled one we are going to double up do two movies again cover mary shelley's frankenstein from 1994 which is the one with robert de niro and kenneth brana and also uh victor frankenstein from 2015 which is the one with james mcavoy and daniel radcliffe of course as i said we are soft cue becoming a daniel radcliffe podcast the transformation will soon be complete yeah and then uh, January 15th, we are finally going to do Dracula, the novel. And then the next week, we are going to do Nosferatu, which will be the first of our mini adaptation episodes. We're going yep. to be doing several. And I think we even had to cut the list down. No, we did. We, we cut <laughs> off several. Like, we were looking at it once. This is a lot of Dracula. <laughs> And then our last episode in January will be Dracula's Guest, which is a short story by Bram Stoker that many believe was originally intended to be the prologue of the novel. So yeah, lots to look forward to. After we're done with Dracula, we'll cover some things that were written after 1950. So <laughs> in case you're not the biggest classic fan. We'll, we'll be back to some more modern things. Yes, sir. And we just want to give a special thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and uh, Logan, the Full Metal Patron. All right. Well, uh, thank you for recording tonight. I had a fantastic time. All right, everybody. Stay tuned for our socials and stay scary. Stay scary, everybody. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. Follow Daniel at DStarSick on Twitter. Follow Ryan at Darth Damio on the Bluebird app. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that The Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Stay scary.